Welcome to Chat with the Lawyer. I'm your host, Walla Blagay, and today we are honored to have Dolores Dorsonville. She is attorney with the DC Bar Council, and she's going to talk to us about ethics of lawyers. Now, this is important because I know a number of you have run into a lawyer who might have violated some ethics, and you wanted to know where to report it to. And many of us really don't know where to report it to or where to go. So Dolores is here to tell us who to talk to. So Dolores, welcome. Thank you, good afternoon. Tell us a little more about your practice. Sure, so my name is Dolores Dorsonville, and I'm a senior staff attorney with the DC Office of Bar Counsel. And that office is charged with investigating and, where necessary, prosecuting cases of uh, allegations of ethical misconduct against District of Columbia lawyers. Prior to that, I was an assistant bar counsel with the Attorney Grievance Commission um, located in Crownsville in Maryland. Um, and that office is bar counsel equivalent, and they, too, were charged with investigating and prosecuting cases against Maryland lawyers for ethical misconduct. Okay. Well, tell us now, tell us some of the things that, um, that we should watch out for, as, you know, of lawyers, you know, the average person. Well, it's important um, for consumers to know, especially uh, one of the missions of Bar Council, of course, is to protect the public. Um, so we take that very seriously at Bar Council's office. And, um, you know, unfortunately, some of the instances that you see of, of lawyer misconduct are usually the more egregious kind, the one that you see in in newspapers and articles and, uh, you know, likewise on television. Um, so unfortunately, it's important that consumers know where to go. And a lot of times, you know, they're not really sure because they think that, you know, if it's, a, if, if it's an act of negligence that, you know, maybe they need to, you know, institute some sort of, you know, malpractice or something like that against their attorney. Um, but there are offices uh, and every jurisdiction in the United States has a bar counsel equivalent. So if you know, a person is having a problem with their lawyer, uh, they can certainly contact bar counsel. Um, and that's not necessarily to say that every case will be prosecuted, but certainly every case will be looked at um, uh, to ensure that you know, lawyers are, are remaining compliant with the rules. Now, what are the common problems? Talk about some of the most of the things that you see often in your office so people can be aware of things they can report. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say um, the, probably the biggest complaint that we see is that uh, uh, consumers feel that um, they're not getting adequate communication with their lawyers. So persons who feel like they're not able to talk to their lawyers when they you know, need to or they're not being properly updated with regard to the status of their matter, um, or they're not being given you know, enough information so that they can decide one way or another what it is that they should um, be doing in terms of the underlying matter. Uh, that's probably the biggest complaint that we see. Um, so, you know, and, and there are ways to address that. Certainly lawyers um, at the outset of a representation can let their clients know or prospective clients know uh, what they deem reasonable communications to be. Um, because, as you know, under Rule 1.4, all it says is reasonable communication. It doesn't actually uh, define what that is. So, so what, each what, what is Rule 1.4? I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 no, not, oh, everybody's not watching. They're not lawyers. So. Understood. Understood. So the rules that govern uh, attorney conduct is the rules of professional conduct. So Maryland has a set of rules. The District of Columbia has their own set of rules. Um, and they're all modeled after the American Bar Association model rules of professional conduct. Um, and they're all very similar, uh, but Rule 1.4 in particular deals with the rule that deals with communication. So the rule simply say, says that a lawyer um, has to, you know, keep their client reasonably informed, you know, of, of the status of their matter um, and, and to have some sort of reasonable communication with them. However, the rule itself doesn't define what's considered reasonable. Um, so from a bar counsel perspective, I was put the onus on the lawyer um, to at least communicate to the client what they deem to be reasonable. So for instance, uh, you know, if you're representing a client in a family law matter, and let's say it's a, a matter that, that may be in litigation, and in which case, you know, there, there may be a lot of, you know, different things happening, you know, deadlines coming up. Um, it probably is important for the lawyer to know, or the lawyer to communicate to the client that all communications will be returned within either a 24 or 48 hour um, window. That way, mm -hmm. the client can feel, you know, they can feel rest assured that, you know, even if they don't hear from their lawyer immediately, you know, either that day, certainly within 48 hours, um, you know, if a matter is in litigation, that they will at least be able to talk to their lawyer. 
Um, now, there are other instances where, you know, there isn't set deadlines and mm -hmm. sometimes with cases something isn't happening for a longer period of time. Exactly. Um, it's certainly very prudent for a lawyer to let the client know, you know, in cases like that where there isn't something happening. Um, you know, they might want to just send a letter to the client letting them know, you know, I know we haven't communicated in 60 or 90 days and, mm -hmm. you know, nothing's happening right now with your case, but Mm -hmm. You know, that just means that we're either, you know, waiting for the other side to do something, we're waiting for, um, you know, the court to make a ruling on this outstanding motion or what have you, just so that the client feels like even though nothing's actively happening, that the lawyer is still paying attention to their matter. Now, I mean, from a lawyer's perspective, a lot of times you've got hundreds of cases and a lot of stuff going on. I mean, do you, if there's no ongoing litigation, I mean, do you have... You know, are you all lenient, lenient with that? Well, here's how it works. <laughs> um, and I try to tell lawyers this every time I get an opportunity. Even though the lawyer may have, you know, hundreds of cases that they're currently working on, they have to remember that from, you know, the client perspective, the client has one matter that they're worried about. And that matter is the most important matter to them. Um, and many times these are matters, you know, of a personal nature, especially if it's, you know, family law related or if it's something that's in litigation. It's something that's personal, you know, it could be, you know, anything. Um, so even though, you know, lawyers pulled in many different directions and, you know, has lots of things to do in lots of different cases, they still do owe many duties to their individual clients. Um, so, you know, Bar Council takes lots of different things into consideration. However, you know, a lawyer that's dropping the ball and not communicating with their client or not being diligent or not being competent, I mean, those are the types of things that the Bar Council takes very seriously. Interesting. Well, what about this attorney-client privilege? Explain that. Most people we hear it, we don't know what it is. What, explain that. Um, well, that just, um, that really just protects the information flow between the attorney and the client. Um, so there's a, another rule that kind of deals with confidentiality, and that's Rule 1.6. And what Rule 1.6 says is that anything and everything that the lawyer, you know, knows about the client and their underlying matter is to be kept confidential. Um, and, you know, it, it's a very clear and very direct rule. However, there are some exceptions. Um, you know, if the client gives consent and tells the lawyer, you know, I will allow you to make certain disclosures, you know, to persons outside of this attorney-client relationship. Um, then that would be allowed. Um, so the privilege comes into play usually in evidentiary settings. So, you know, if it's something before a tribunal or, um, you know, things like depositions, that sort of thing, um, you know, they can invoke the privilege, which means, you know, any communications between the attorney and the client would be considered confidential. Interesting. Now, do you all get a lot of confidentiality cases in bar counsel? Oh. And yes, what, what, I mean, like, can you give us a range of what the issues are? Sure, I would say uh, probably more recently, one of the bigger issues that I've been seeing with regard to Rule 1.6 confidentiality um, deals with noisy withdrawals, that's what we call it. So there are points in time in the representation where a lawyer may not be able to continue the representation. They may have to terminate the representation or withdraw from the representation. Um, and if it's a matter before a tribunal, they'd have to file what we call a motion to withdraw. Now, the motion to withdraw really has to be very, very basic, very boilerplate. And as a matter of fact, Rule 1.6 pretty much sets forth what the lawyer can say. And there's only one thing that a lawyer can say, which is, my client and I are having irreconcilable differences. Um, however, what lawyers are doing in order to ensure that the courts are granting their motions to withdraw is that they're putting a lot of information, confidential information in there. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's like a dispute between, you know, the attorney and the client, they're including that information in there. Um, let's say, for instance, if the client isn't paying the lawyer, mm -hmm. um, they're including that information in there as well. Um, let's say that the, the client wants the lawyer to pursue a course of action that the lawyer may deem fraudulent or criminal or, you know, something of that nature, the lawyer may include that information as well. And as you know, I mean, those are all things, you know, once you file something with the court, it's considered a public document. It's mm -hmm. part of the public record. And in which case, if you're saying these bad things about your client in a public document, of course, you know, not just the opposing party can see it, 
with the courts, anyone who, you know, pretty much Googles the person's name can go down to the courthouse and get uh, a copy of that and, and, you know, learn this information which um, would put the client in a bad or negative light. So though, that's probably the biggest 1.6 violation that we're seeing more recently. So, you know, if lawyers are not sure what to do if they have a situation where they need to file such a motion and they need to get out irreconcilable differences. I mean, it's stated right in the rules. Interesting. Well, let's go into, you know, there's one thing I want to touch, because I don't think many people know this. Now, some people use lawyers as almost their psychiatrists, so mm -hmm. they come and just tell them everything. Now, let's just say this person is thinking of getting into some criminal activity, more criminal, or maybe they're, at a, they, you know, it's like a family law dispute. They're so sick of, they're like, I'm going to break into this house. I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to do this to this person. Um, and they're telling their lawyer that, does the lawyer have to report that? Is, you, you know, at, is the confidentiality still there? Absolutely. So here's the thing. A lawyer cannot make disclosures um, of that nature unless it falls under one of the exceptions under Rule 1.6. Um, and, and What's the even, exception? And 1.6 has six different exceptions where a lawyer can make certain disclosures. So if a situation where a lawyer believes that um, you know, a client's actions may result in some bodily harm okay. or, or something, you know, so really serious. Harm. Okay. Right. If it's going to result in death or some serious bodily harm, then they can make disclosures about, you know, what it is that the, you know, client intends to do. Um, if it's something where the, the client is using the lawyer's services in furtherance of some sort of fraud or some sort of, you know, criminal activity, that makes sense. you know, okay. then they can, you know, make certain disclosures, um, you know, but if, if, if a client simply tells you what it is that they plan to do, that in and of itself doesn't seem to rise to the level of one of the exceptions under Rule 1.6. Because as you know, voila, <laughs> clients make all kinds of disclosures to their attorneys. That's true. Um, and, you know, the, the heart of the attorney-client relationship is that, you know, the, the parties can have open and honest conversations with each other. And nobody wants to feel like, you know, they're going to tell their their lawyer some information that their lawyer is going to turn around and reveal to the world. Them, yeah. So it's really important for the lawyer to kind of, you know, kind of look at the whole picture and, and take things in context. Now, if you have a client who's a hothead who comes in waving a gun and says, I'm going to kill her and then goes running out the door. <laughs> then that's, that, that's a problem. <laughs> you know, then, then you can infer from that action that the client may very well carry out some sort of bodily right. harm or, right. you know, yeah. try to kill someone, in which case then that's okay. Um, but if people just, you know, kind of talk to you about what it is that they, you know, think they want to do, but you're not getting the impression that the person's actually going to, you know, go out and do that, then yeah. to know you shouldn't make those kinds of disclosures. Okay. Well, we're going to talk, we're going to come back and talk a, a little more about payment and, um, and about conflict of interest. So how about that? So please stay, stay with us. With liberty and justice for all. Does that mean bunnies? Bunnies are so cute. And kitties? And puppies? Only some animals have basic rights and protections. What about mice? And rats? Chickens? Cows? Pigs? Every year in the U.S., thousands of companion animals and billions of factory farm and lab animals are legally abused and killed. What about sheep? Sheep are kinda cute. I like sheep. Without your help, torture and mutilation will continue to be okay in the name of corporate greed. But it can be stopped. Join the Animal Legal Defense Fund and tell Congress you support sensible, humane laws. Add your voice to the growing chorus of Americans' domestic rights and protections for all living creatures. Okay, liberty and justice for the sheep. Sign the petition at animalbillofrights.org. Don't forget the puppies. Welcome back to Chat with the Lawyer. I'm here with Dolores Dorsetville and we're talking about ethics of lawyers. So we're going to jump right back into it and talk about payment. Now that's a huge issue. Um, you know, someone's paying a lawyer, they're not sure if the lawyer is doing the work. So, you know, can you walk us through the rules and, and where, you know, what is ethical, what is it? Sure. So at the point in time that the client makes payments to the lawyer, that's governed by our rule 1.15, which is safekeeping of property. Um, so under that rule, if it's what we call an advanced retainer, meaning the lawyer is going to perform services based on this payment, you know, it's, you know, sometime in the future, 
then that money is considered the client's property, and in which case the lawyer has to, under rule, put those funds into what's called an, a trust account or um, an IOLTA account. And IOLTA just stands for Interest on Lawyer's Trust Account. Um, and and those funds are and then, so we're, let's just let's just stop it. So it's a contingency, right? So what what type of cases are these usually? Well, contingency fee case is a little different. I mean, okay. if we're talking about advance fees where the client fronts the money and provides those funds to the lawyer, that's considered entrusted funds. And entrusted so the lawyer, okay. the lawyer would then bill against that money. I mean, that it's a classic retainer. Right. So exactly. it's a classic so this, retainer. So this is like, pay me two thousand dollars now. As I do the work, I'll pretty much give you a bill, and I'll take from that fund. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. So those funds have to stay in trust until the lawyer performs the services, okay? Right. And it's really okay. for the benefit of the client as well as the lawyer, um, because you know if there's a situation where there's a dispute about something the lawyer did or did not do, the funds you know, should remain intact until such time that the dispute is resolved. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. So now what if I, as a consumer, pays a lawyer um, $10,000 for something, the lawyer says, okay, I'll get to it, you know, and it's been months and he hasn't done anything, do it, can I, do I call bar counsel at that point or? Sure, you can. Okay. So here's the thing, and I found, and you know, my boss who was bar counsel, he takes statistics and he um, has found that at the heart of many um, uh, complaints against lawyers, it's really a fee dispute, okay? okay? So if it's something that is strictly a fee dispute that doesn't implicate any of the other ethical rules, then bar counsel is not in a position to handle that because there's actually other agencies that deal strictly with fee disputes. And who are those? Um, so in the District of Columbia, it's the um, Attorney Client Arbitration Board, and they okay. are with the DC Bar. In Maryland, every county bar association has their own fee dispute committee. So you know, if a client you know has a dispute about you know some funds that they pay, paid a lawyer or they're looking so for a refund they can actually file a fee petition with each county bar association. Okay, so what, uh, Prince George's County. We're in Prince George's County. So that we should look up Prince George's County right. fee dispute? Right, you can go to the Prince George's County Bar Association and within that committee they have a fee dispute committee. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, so you can just freely just send a letter to them? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so if it's just, you know, just a classic straight fee dispute, then that will go before the fee dispute committees. However, in your hypothetical, if it's, um, you know, a fee dispute as well as an implication of the other rules, such as I paid my lawyer $10,000 and they did nothing, you know, that immediately raises red flags. And that, you know, would tell bar counsel, you know, maybe there's some neglect here. You know, there might be some communication issues, some other things that bar counsel would be interested in investigating. Right. And in which case, that client can file a complaint with bar counsel's office. And we would look at that. Now, however, bar counsel doesn't have, um, you know, we don't have the ability to make a lawyer give back any money. We, we can't make anyone um, provide restitution for services that weren't performed. However, you know, in terms of um, what it is that we can do, we can certainly make recommendations um, that would affect an attorney's licensure. Um, so, you know. It's a disbarment. <laughs> it, right, disbarment. I mean, I mean, <laughs> disbar, disbarment, I mean, that's the highest form of a sanction um, in any and every jurisdiction. So, um, you know, if, if the misconduct is egregious enough, um, you know, the Court of Appeals can certainly um, order an attorney being disbarred, sure. Okay. Well, talk about some other, because I'm sure the money issue comes often before us. Talk about some of the other cases you see often at the Bar Council. Sure. So, I mean, communication is probably, you know, one of the more common and biggest complaints that we see. Neglect, um, that's a huge issue. Um, where, what, do, what do you mean by neglect? Neglect, where, uh, you know, persons hire lawyers to, you know, perform certain services and then nothing gets done. Um, or, or sometimes lawyers will actually start some of the work, but then you know they kind of drop the ball and things fall by the wayside. Um, and in which case, you know, lawyers, uh, clients' matters aren't being prosecuted; they're not being pursued. Um, in a number of cases, you know, we've seen matters where uh, clients' matters are actually being dismissed by the courts for lack of prosecution because. You know, either the lawyers aren't, you know, having the, the opposing parties served or they're just not filing, you know, responsive pleadings. They're not responding to motions for, you know, for show cause. 
um, and that sort of thing. So, I mean, there, there are a number of issues that kind of go with neglect, but essentially any time that a lawyer isn't moving the ball forward and actually, you know, trying to at least resolve the client's matter, then that's considered a neglect issue. Okay, and what's some of the other cases you see other than communication and, neg and neglect? Mm -hmm. Okay, so another, um, I guess another big area that we see is overdraft on attorneys' trust accounts. Um, mm -hmm. And what, you know, members of the public may or may not know is that um, if a lawyer's trust account ever um, is presented and has insufficient funds in it, then bar counsel, you know, by statute has to be notified about okay. these overdrafts on the account. Wow. Because what that tells us is that, you know, there's an issue. Because, you know, lawyer trust accounts are accounts specifically for entrusted funds. I mean, these are funds that belong to clients or third parties, so there never should be a situation where there's an overdraft on monies that belong to other people. And if there is, then it means that, you know, the lawyer may not be, you know, doing some sort of reconciliation properly. Right. Um, you know, it could be a, a sign of misappropriation, which just mm -hmm. means that the lawyer, you know, is stealing monies that don't belong to them. Um, there could be commingling issues, and that just means where the lawyer's mixing their money in with, you know, client and third parties' uh, monies. Um, so there's a number of different things that, that could, uh, you know, be happening as a result of an overdraft. So Bar Council is always interested in those types of cases and, and we're seeing more and more uh, overdraft matters. Interesting. Now we have communications, neglect, overdraft. Now what else? We're gonna go over five. What, is there any, any other big cases you see? Because this is giving the people, people a, sort of a picture of what they should start looking for if there's problems. Mm -hmm. um, dishonesty. Dishonesty is always, unfortunately, um, you know, a big issue. And that just means um, cases where lawyers are either making, you know, misrepresentations about the underlying matter, or it could be a situation where lawyers are making misrepresentations about things that are going on in their, you know, own personal lives. Um, and that's another thing that, that lawyers, and as well as the public, need to be mindful of, that lawyers, um, they're subject to the rules of professional conduct whether they're representing a client or not. So long as you hold a license to practice in a jurisdiction, you know, bar counsel has jurisdiction over you. Okay. So if you're doing things such as, you know, failing to file your taxes or, you know, you're engaging in some sort of dishonest conduct, mm -hmm. even if it's in your personal life, then it's a bar counsel issue because that speaks to your fitness to practice law, which is something which is very important, you know, for bar counsel to know. Um, so dishonesty is huge. Uh, I mean, we see cases where lawyers make representations to the clients about what it is that they're doing in the underlying matter, and then we come to learn that they haven't done that, which is why either, mm -hmm. you know, courts are dismissing cases, and, you know, unfortunately, lawyers are lying to their clients about what they're doing, and the documents tell a different story. Interesting. Well, what about, um, you know, we watch movies where we have, you know, the, the attorneys that they call, like, ambulance chasers, and they're going to the hospital talking to people, trying to get them to, like, take their services. Are there any, um, you know, sort of guidelines on that? Well, we do see um, complaints dealing with, and, and we call them runners, so basically people who go out and drum up business and work for lawyers. Um, we do see complaints about that. And, you know, in both jurisdictions, it's not permitted. I mean, a lawyer is not, not permitted to pay someone who's not an employee to essentially go out and, you know, get these sorts of referrals. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a rule that, you know, specifically speaks about that, and it is prohibited. Okay, well then that's good to know. Now we can jump into, so what are the misconceptions of like ethics of lawyers? Some of the things that you sort of, that people assume but it's not quite true. Oh, there's lots of that. Okay. So um, probably the biggest conception is that lawyer, the misconception by lawyers, I will say lawyers have a misconception that bar counsel prosecutes every single case that comes through the door. And I'm here to let you know that that is absolutely not the case. Mm -hmm. um, bar Council sees, you know, in the state of Maryland, roughly 2,000 complaints a year out of 36,000 lawyers. Um, it would be impossible because our burden of proof is clear and convincing. It would be impossible for Bar Council to prosecute 2,000 cases a year. Um, you know, if you, if you look at the cases that come down from the Court of Appeals, and that is the highest court in the jurisdiction, which actually um, 
you know, issues the order sanctioning lawyers, you know, we're looking at a much smaller number, probably anywhere from, you know, 30 to 50 cases a year. Um, so that should just give you, you know, a perspective. Other misconceptions um, is that uh, people believe that young lawyers are the ones that are, you know, coming into the practice of law and they're the ones kind of, you know, making a mockery of the system and making a lot of mistakes. That's actually not the case. <laughs> um, our statistics show that the bulk of our respondents fall anywhere from 7 to 17 years out in practice. Um, so we're looking at definitely, you know, a, a lot more seasoned group, um, especially if you've been practicing, seven, you know, 17 years. Um, and I think that's probably because, you know, in both jurisdictions, the District of Columbia and Maryland, there's not what we call a mandatory CLE requirement, and CLE stands for Continuing Legal Education. So, you know, many lawyers, you know, the last time they took a course to refresh themselves on, on you know, what's, you know, what they need to know in terms of their practice area could have been when they took the bar exam. So that could have been anywhere wow, from, that can make sense. That you know, makes sense. 10, 17 years ago. Um, so, you know, that, that's one of the things. Yeah. Um, other misconception is that, you know, bar council targets attorneys of color um, and also solo and small firm practitioners, and that's actually not the case as well. Now, I will say that there is a disproportionate amount of um, solo and small attorneys that do come before bar council. Um, in the District of Columbia, the numbers are as high as 50 percent. So 50 percent of the cases that we prosecute, you know, are against solo and small firm lawyers. Um, but the thing about bar council is that we're complaint driven. So, you know, bar council doesn't have like a list that shows us who's a solo or who's a small firm lawyer. Um, we come to know about allegations of ethical misconduct based on complaints that come through the door. Okay. So, you know, and I think that those numbers are particularly high because a lot of solo and small firm lawyers do more consumer-based type practices. Right. Things like, you know, family law and personal injury, uh, immigration, that's another uh, high practice area. So, you know, these consumer-based type practice areas, um, you know, they're, they're the ones that are coming to bar counsel for help when they're having troubles with their lawyer. And what I always tell lawyers to remember is that when a Fortune 500 company is no longer satisfied with what their lawyer is doing, do you know what they do? They take their business elsewhere. Right. <laughs> um, you know, for your, you know, your everyday, you know, Joe and Jane Smith, right. when they're upset and they feel like they're not getting the services that they want, what they do is they go to bar counsel. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for this great presentation. We're going to have to have you come back on. Now, if someone wants to contact you or Bar Council, you let us know who to contact. Sure. If anyone's having a problem with their lawyer, they can certainly contact the D.C. Bar Council's office. Um, and we're at 202-638-1501. You can contact me at D at dcobc.org or you can contact me at Dolores at DoloresDorsonville.com and that's spelled Dorsonville, D as in David, O-R-S-A-I, N like Nancy, V like Victor, I-L. All right, well thank you so much Dolores and if you want to see more of our shows you can look at our website at www.wallablegay.com. Thank you for joining us. Don't leave your child alone in a car because this can do this. Power windows have hurt or killed hundreds of children. So never ever leave a child alone in a car.